So if you saw my top 10 best movies of the year list I did a while back, then you know that I'm one of the most independent movie critics out there. And five of my choices had a generally negative reception on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, here it's even more independent. It turns out six of the movies that I'm going to be talking about have a fresh rating. So I know there are fans out there who like these movies, and if you like them, that's terrific. I always like it when someone sees more in a movie than I did. But for these ones, if anyone asked, I would say avoid them. Unless you like, well, I wouldn't say bad movies, but if you like that type, then perhaps, but probably not. So anyway, before I start talking more and more gibberish, as I usually do, let's start off with number 10 of my least favorite movies of 2015. So starting off our list is Kingsman Secret Service. I'm sorry, I know there are a lot of people out there who like this movie, but I just had to put it on this list. I will admit that the movie has a lot going for it, and it is very good in most parts, especially the acting scenes. I mean, did you think any different that the action would be the best part? I mean, it's as gory as kick-ass, and it may be just it may be even better, especially during the church scene. And the action scenes really help me get past all the bad lisp that everyone has that makes it hard for me to understand. But the first half of this movie is quite unforgivable. I'm not going to spoil the whole thing, but to sum it up, it's training. And a lot of training that is a perfect example of what not to do when you want to recruit someone with heart and consideration. Let me give you one example of this. The Kingsman recruits are tricked into thinking that they're about to be run over by a train unless they give Kingsman information to the bad guys. And then they ask, is Kingsman worth dying for? Well, I've got an answer for you. No! A corporation that plays with your life is not worth a plug nickel. And the fact that it tries to forgive and forget is the reason that I had to put it on the list. Now, I was very excited for number nine, and I'm sorry, reluctantly, I have to put the Duff D-U-F-F on the list. And this movie features some of my most favorite actors, Mae Whitman, Robbie Hamill, Bella Thorne, and yet somehow they don't make it work. And I like the concept of the movie, about how in every group of people, there is someone who's uglier and less beautiful or handsome, and that in the long run, we all are that. But that can't get past the fact that there's just no story that I could connect with. I ended up being very bored after one hour, I ended up checking my watch repeatedly, and I realized that Bianca doesn't have any motivation, any ambition, and neither does the movie. It may have a slight one, but a very slight one, and a very predictable one at that. Just, I wouldn't say it's worth watching. Now taking the number eight spot is Unfinished Business. You know, I was starting to really get into these party movies after I saw 21 and Over with my friend Liam Brierley about a year ago. I ended up loving that movie. It was one of the funniest stint movies, and yet one of the most exciting I've seen in years. Its last 10 minutes were as exciting as the last 10 minutes of Arthur Christmas. So what went wrong here in Unfinished Business, a movie that made me ashamed of liking that movie in the first place? Well, in short terms, the story is non-existent, the characters are annoying to a fault, and really, whoever came up with these jokes doesn't have the right idea for humor. Stuttering all the time by Dave Franco and all this annoying arguments with Vince Vaughn is just not very funny. There are some moments where I smiled a little, but it can't get past the fact that there's no story and it's a shame because this is from the same director of Delivery Man. That movie was much better. Oh, coming in at number seven is Pitch Perfect 2. And it's a shame because everyone in my music class when I was in grade 11 was so excited to see this movie, including me, especially considering the fact that I loved the first Pitch Perfect and I was so excited to dive in and listen to what would be soon one of my new favorite songs. And 
Let's just start with the story. The Bellas spend more than half of their time trying to rediscover their voice, their sound, after a very embarrassing accident, like the start of the first one. And that's kind of funny considering as how we're with the Bellas the entire time, trying to rediscover their noise. And it seems that so is the entire movie. It's such a shadow of the first film that it's very sad. I don't know whose idea it was to make the Troublemakers, one of the best parts of the first movie, aka the main rivals, sing a song that had lollipop in the lyrics at the beginning, but whoever did doesn't really understand good music, I think. I will admit, the final two songs are terrific, they're awesome, and very surprising, they're good, but it can't make up for the fact that John and Gail are criticizing the Bellas left and right and we can't help but agree with them. And the scene that really made me decide that this was probably going to make my worst list was a scene involving Fat Amy and her crush, um, which was so blunt and so confusing and empty and to make up for it they tried to do another song. And what's wrong with the music, I think, as advice to the whole Bellas and the whole movie, was that half the time I couldn't understand the lyrics. I couldn't understand what they were singing even. That's something that never happened in Pitch Perfect. Or if it did, then it just needed another little ear and a happy ear to listen to it again. I'm sorry, but hopefully Pitch Perfect 3 will be better than this. We can only hope. Now, this is the only animated movie that I'm putting on this list, but coming in at number six is the Spongebob movie, Sponge Out of Water. Sponge Out of Works is more like it. If you remember, at the start of the year, I made a video saying whether or not the Spongebob movie was going to be good or bad. I said it did have good, but it seemed to be hinting toward a bad movie, and it turns out, yep, I was correct. It was very bad, away at the bottom of the barrel. Let me tell you something. The first Spongebob movie back in 2004 was supposed to be the end of the series. And it didn't because the movie was so successful, but Steven Hillenburg left the production. And the sponge out of water sadly made me wish that they quit while they were ahead. And that's sad considering just like Pitch Perfect 2, I was waiting a very long time for this movie. The first scenes with Antonio Banderas and those singing pelicans looks like it was from a direct-to-DVD movie. The story is 100% full-on cartoon, with all of the characters that we've grown to love act as maniacs that apparently treat the Krabby Patty like medicine to the Daily Plague or something, which is, if it was in any way accurate, then people would go to the Krusty Krab by the truckload 24 hours a day, or something. Not to mention the fact that after Spongebob and Plankton, I'm not making this up, but I wish I were, almost get executed, then he, with Plankton hiding, and his team of almost executioners go up after two-thirds of the movie is over to fight Burger Beard. And so many of the action scenes were given away in the trailer which probably wouldn't have been a problem if most of the movie wasn't under the water and the main event that we already saw was at the very, very end, which was what I was looking forward to. Not to mention that when they capture Burger Beard, <laughs> Mr. Krabs releases one of his hands that is holding Burger Beard in captivity for a big handshake and he gets away. Like, writers can't get much lazier than that. So, I'm sorry, in the end, the sponge out of water was complete nautical nonsense, but there is such a thing as good and bad nautical nonsense. You're better off watching the original 2004 movie. It grew on me. And this movie won't. Now, coming in at number five is Get Hard. I kind of started this movie feeling like I was going to hate it anyway. Yeah, I guess I just wasn't in the spirit. Because in the trailer, Will Ferrell's character just puts his hands up, is so scared, just from his own assumptions, and I groaned when I first saw the trailer. But I then thought, this movie could have a moral about it, about all the doofuses who are racist and think less of someone from their skin color to be wrong about the whole thing. But it turns out, 
Get Hard is pretty racist and pretty unenjoyable and really makes people with dark skin look incompetent in life. Then again, so are a lot of the white chicks. I wish we could just get a comedy where skin color doesn't matter, and I know that there are a lot around, but I just can't think of any off the top of my head right now. Sorry, I'm concentrating too much on giving you this video. I feel that the only good thing in this movie was Kevin Hart. He was terrific and was very nice to listen to. But the whole story around him about James's conviction just feels like a been there, done that movie. Now, coming in at number four is a movie that I took my grandparents to see in the theater. I was so excited for this movie, and it's apparently based off of a TV show that was way back when made. And that is The Man from Uncle. Army Hammer's character was so annoying with his big fake Russian accent, and Napoleon Solo's character not only had a backstory that was put in by Projector, that was exactly the same as Frank Abagnale's story, but he was just as emotionless. And I don't know who would find it funny to watch Napoleon Solo hiding in a truck, just munching on some snacks while his sidekick is just racing around, being shot at, and nearly being killed. Not only that, but the movie has three false endings and a story that was so difficult to follow because of all the flashbacks on how they pickpocketed something that it was just ridiculous and I was squirming in my seat more than any other movie I've seen this year. Now, number three is Fifty Shades of Grey. I was going to read the book a while back, but now I really don't think I will. It would probably be completely boring and completely upsetting and just weird. I've heard that it has very bad dialogue, very bad writing, and it shows here in the movie. Look, it does have a few good things, such as Dakota Johnson and a pretty interesting soundtrack and a good last two minutes, I suppose. But that's really all I can say. The movie portrays Dakota Johnson and basically every other female who was going to see this movie as incompetent, robotic, and unable to choose for themselves. And the BDSM in this movie was so sarcastic and overdone, which I guess is the point, that every time one came up I groaned and felt embarrassed to actually be continuing the movie. After one sitting, I'm no longer interested in seeing any more grey entertainment. When Fifty Shades Darker comes, I'm sorry, but you've lost a customer. Now coming in at number two is Aloha. I played the movie thinking that Aloha could be good. I, I like Bradley Cooper and Emma Stone fair enough, but really all you've heard is true. Emma Stone is the only good thing about this movie really is Captain MZ, and it's too depressing to think what else she could have been in. I'm sorry, but it's just another typical love story about meeting a new girl who looks 10 years younger than you and talking with your divorced wife and landing a satellite up there, which half of the time you keep forgetting about because you don't care or the story is just not understandable. And right when the opening scene came up, I started checking my watch and I checked it like every one minute thinking, okay, this is about an hour and 40 minutes. Can I survive this? No, I wasn't able to survive the whole movie. Mm. But there is one other movie. I was close to giving Aloha an F. Well, how do you... Can you see that? That's, that's how I do it with my finger. That's how Flute from Spy Kids does it. This was the only movie I've seen this year that has a full-on F. And yes, it has a positive rating on Rotten Tomatoes and it was nominated for Best Picture, so I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of hate on this, but think for yourself. And that's what I do. Some may see this as cheating, because for some this movie came out in December last year, but for me it came out in January this year, so I guess it counts. And in case you haven't guessed from my little hints that I just gave, the worst movie that I've seen all year is American Sniper. This is the story of Chris Kyle, a former Navy SEAL who apparently killed the most people out of all of the army. 
And really, right away, I saw a very big problem with this movie because exactly how are we supposed to feel sympathy for a man who almost kills someone when he realizes that his girlfriend was cheating on him, as well as him killing a wife and a kid, even if they were throwing a bomb at them. We also get a hint that he got his motivations for killing after watching 9-11. Okay, right away I knew that wasn't a good idea because I know that 9-11 was a very serious thing back in the day and still is, but 9-11 is portrayed in too many movies these days. I mean, I know it was in Survivor, which is one of my favorite movies of the year, but they also chose to have that in Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit, and that movie was pretty bad. And apart from that and a real-life video of someone who got executed under someone who looks like ISIS, I'm not very good with history on this stuff, that's the only sign of attacks from the enemy territory. Oh, and a killing that happens to one of the troops, we don't really care about any of these troops, we don't even know their names, we only know Chris Kyle and his wife Taya, and Bradley Cooper's character Chris Kyle says that they will pay for what they did to him, while they already did like 20 different shots. And during these battle scenes, half the time I couldn't even tell where the shots were coming from. It all felt like a huge movie set. And earlier on in the film, when one of his troops is thinking about quitting, Chris Kyle asks, Would, do you want to see a terrorist or attack in San Diego or somewhere? My response is, yes, if that would make the movie any better. I'm not suggesting that I want someone to head into San Diego and start shooting up the place, but it would have been much more entertaining and sympathetic to watch if we could see any more shots fired from the opposite side. Here's one thing that I feel I disliked, but maybe I shouldn't have disliked. Chris says when his wife Taya gets pregnant that he is sure that he knows that their baby is going to be a boy. And off on one of his missions, she calls him and tells him it is going to be a boy. And the army shoots their hands up they, and they clap. Um, that's not a really good thing to have in your movie. That's sexist and that's very unnecessary. Ugh. And you know the one thing I was very excited to see after all of this nonsense? Chris Kyle's death. And I know that Taya Kyle, the real Chris Kyle's wife, didn't want it to be put in and... But basically, I gave the movie an F. So if that's not all spoilers enough, I'm sorry. But you've probably already seen the movie by now and if you want to see it, go right ahead. You shouldn't change your opinion because of me. But be warned. Not to mention that this movie tries to be as exciting as Saving Private Ryan, but I ended up checking my watch just as many times as Aloha. So let that sink in for a moment. Mm -hmm. So that's my 10 worst movies of the year list. The year has come to a close, and I hope that 2016 will be a better year than this one. And let me know what some of your least favorite movies of this year were. I'm sure that there's a lot of different opinions all around the internet.